Hello and welcome to the YouTube podcast series of Dinner Squada, Cities ABC and Open Business Council. I'm Hilton Supra, the Vice Chairman of Student Group, and I'm pleased to conduct this interview today with Libby Daziz, the CEO of People of Culture Studios in LA, where we interview people who are changing the world. People who are inspiring us and the world with their achievements, creativity and acumen with the use of technology. In previous interviews, Dennis Squad and I have interviewed more than 200 amazing people and achieved more than 10 million views. This interview series is in partnership with our platforms, openbusinesscouncil.org, citiesabc.com, and fashionabc.org, all fourth industrial revolution-based platforms which employ the use of truth and trust through blockchain and the deployment of data analytics, AI, and machine learning. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Libby Daziz, the CEO of People of Culture, Studios, the first of its kind diverse content studio, studio offering an all-inclusive and true equity and equality approach to producing, financing, and distributing films, TV, and content intended for a global audience, all under one roof. Libid is a film producer and a CEO of the, the content studio, and his strategic operations focus is an executive, he's made films, and he looks at the world both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. And his operational knowledge in terms of senior management positions and companies in technology and media and communications industry has given him a wonderful platform to really develop the people of Culture Studios, which is really forward thinking in terms of an all-inclusive approach to producing, financing and distributing films. The, the team puts a their combined power together to be very resourceful in producing selective slate of diverse stories and talking to this global community in terms of what is the interaction and prestige and the commercial appeal that happens in communication at all using um, his platform. So, Libid, welcome. Thank you, Hilton. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for having me today. We're really delighted to talk a little bit about where you came from, where you're born, and where you are at the moment. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I am, uh, as you can tell, uh, very European by, by look and by hair color and color of the eyes. Uh, <laughs> I was ironically born in Sweden in the 70s, uh, and I lived there for seven years. So I am a Swedish by birth and Bangladeshi by origin. And if we get technical, because this is sort of ultimately how we like to look at the world from our lens at People of Culture Studios, uh, my parents and my grandparents were actually born in British India, which then became East Pakistan, which then became Bangladesh, right? So mm -hmm. even in our own little history, uh, there is a unity that people tend to forget or ignore or not acknowledge. And mm -hmm. I think that my own upbringing has obviously helped shape who I am and what I am. And then having grown up in the US from Texas to New Hampshire, Boston, with a stint in New York and now Los Angeles, uh, I, I feel honored and humbled that I can consider myself a true global citizen. Yeah. So that whole third dimension to your 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 life and your experience, having been born, you know, in various countries from different parents. You know, you're 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 speaking to a, an audience that is, is experiencing the same thing which I think is very, very, very um, um, empowering, if you understand that. I hope so. I mean, I, I you know, um, it's, it's important to, to know history, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. and not just your own history, but the world's history and, and what individual people of culture have gone through um, and their struggles and their hurdles and obstacles and how that's shaped the present and hopefully the outlook for the future. And, mm -hmm. and so having had the benefit of this sort of global upbringing, uh, I take a lot of pride in making sure to value and respect people and, and cultures. And um, I think that's how we approach every everything, whether it's life or business, it's knowing the other or taking the time to know the other and presenting yourself with, with dignity and integrity and, and listening and mm -hmm. understanding. Because if you're doing business in in the UAE or Russia or Brazil or Japan and China, there's little nuances about the approach and, and how to uh, inspire confidence and, and warmth and hopefully even a sense of camaraderie and love. And, and I think having hopefully this perspective allows me to approach every table with that lens. 
No, this is very interesting. I mean, from your your perspective, you know, as a young boy growing up in Sweden, um, went to school, and then you said at the age of 16, you know, things, did, did you go off to university after you left school? What was the the roadmap that you had? In your uh, we, yeah, so we left, we left Sweden. My dad, my dad got his PhD in chemistry at the University of Jokoberi. And uh, so after that, he got stationed in College Station, Texas A&M, got his postdoc and was, you know, teaching and learning. And then he got a job in New Hampshire. So I would consider New Hampshire and New England sort of my, my formative uh, formal years from junior high to high school. And at the time, uh, I'd gotten accepted into Phillips Exeter Academy, and I was entering my second year. And uh, my mom got a little scared because she'd heard that, you know, at every at 16, every Swedish male has to go serve in the Swedish army. So she quickly uh, sort of nullified and gave back my passport. Uh, so I'm no longer a Swedish citizen. But as my friends tell me that I just need to go back and, and show them my birth certificate and then I can be a part of the EU again. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was back when I was a sophomore mm -hmm. uh, at Phillips Exeter Academy. My mom didn't want me to get out of private school and, and go back to Sweden to join the army. I understand. And where did your, your interest and love for film start? So ironically, uh, the truth is I, I'm an activist uh, by heart and by mm -hmm. trade. And I can even go back to sixth grade when I convinced the school at the time to convert the janitor's closet into a safe meditation prayer space for the kids in the school, because I saw the tension of the transition from you know grade school to junior high, and let alone oh not not uh, and also um, in New Hampshire there was not a lot of diversity right and religious diversity and cultural diversity, and I just noticed that there was a lot of tension and anxiety amongst the kids for whatever reason and. Uh, I realized having a safe space to go into during the day whenever you wanted to without having anybody judge you or know what you're doing. Um, and again, that notion of a safe space. So I, I, I made that happen when I was in sixth grade and, you know, reflecting on my life, you know, now uh, as a 47 year old uh, man, um, that notion of creating safe spaces has been sort of the backbone of who I am and what I've done and, and really standing up against various injustices along the way. And while I was in college, um, I was lucky to have a lot of friends who wanted to be film directors and actors and, and really involved in the arts. Uh, and I, I dabbled in uh, plays, acting, and uh, I was a, a hip hop dancer in junior high and high school. So I always had a love for media and music anyways, but I went to Brandeis University pre-med program to you know, become a pediatrician because that's what I was supposed to do. Um, uh, following the line of, you know, PhD dad and, and sort of hopefully doctor son. Um, but along the way, I fell in love with the transformative power of storytelling. And I even, because of my own unique background, I, I tend to be able to blend in sort of like a chameleon into different, you know, pockets of people, right? Whether diverse or unique, religious, um, backgrounds, I'm able to sort of blend in and acclimate. Um, and as a result of that, um, I was the master of ceremonies for numerous uh, cultural events on my university's campus, not only for the South Asian students, but for the other groups as well. And um, I had a captive audience of 200 to 2000 people at any given moment because of the cultural show that I was the MC for. And I, I realized I had a certain responsibility, obligation, and also, I guess, uh, power, for lack of a better phrase. And, and what would I do with that other than just having fun and showing off music and dance and culture? So uh, after falling in love with, with film and, and documentaries and this transformative power of storytelling, this was in the 90s, I, I took it upon myself to create these short three to five minute videos that I used to introduce myself as the MC, but what I did with those pieces was to shine a spotlight on the issues that were seeing that I was seeing on campus, like hate crimes, religious intolerance, and just issues that in the micro were also in the macro at the time. And so I created these videos and obviously a little bit of drama, music, humor, 
um, just wanted to shine a light on those issues on campus. And so that's how I, I really got my start. And the trigger for me uh, was senior year when I was you know, coming close to graduation and I didn't really have a plan after school. Um, along the way, I went from a pre-med bio major to a psychology and Near Eastern Judaic studies minor at, uh, <laughs> at Brandeis as a, as a Muslim. And uh, so I was you know, hell bent on trying to figure out what I could do uh, but I didn't really have a direction. But then one of my friends, uh, beginning of senior year, spring semester, came up to me and said, hey, Labid, we just saw one of your videos in Gordy Fellman's Peace and Conflict Resolutions class. And it spawned a three hour long discussion of how we can address the issues that you flagged in your piece. And Hilton, the feeling that I felt at that moment was greater than any feeling I'd ever felt in my entire life. And it, it became the thing that I wanted to feel every day for the rest of my life. It was a transformative moment in my life. And at that point, things became clear and I, I knew what I had to do. And um, with, a, with a buddy of mine, I, I created a presentation for the university president and a few deans. And I convinced them to pay me to go to school for another year, a fifth year post back, mm -hmm. and where I would take the documentary filmmaking professor and the number one business professor in the International Business School to create this post back where they would, the two of them, design a curriculum to teach me how to harness the power of media and create a business around it where I would essentially create media tools and align with organizations, not-for-profit non and for-profit, that were cause-based and policy-based because I knew I wanted to use the, the power, as I was told early on in life, you, you can use the power of the pen or the power of the sword to take on a fight. Uh, and I, I just wanted to take the power of the, of the lens. And, and so I wanted to create this curriculum so these two amazing professors could teach me how to take this intentionality and go out into the world and create a business. And, and, and sort of that's how it started. So it was never a love of film and TV, it was the to harness the power of, of media and storytelling to hopefully have an effect, fundamental change, ultimately early on at the state, local, and le uh, federal level for policy in the US and the causes that I cared about most back then, and I still do now, but it sort of broadened were civil liberties reform, healthcare reform, and education reform. And so that's sort of how it all happened in my first company. Uh, that's what I did for the first few years until I then realized the true transformative power of storytelling is is in entertainment, right? Media and music that can transcend uh, people and cultures and is entertaining because it, with entertainment, we might have the ability to plant seeds of ideas and over the course of time, let those seeds with the right nurturing grow. And if we do it right, maybe over, over, the, over the long run, um, reach critical mass in, mm -hmm. in the community, which then can lead to hopefully transformative change that has lasting power. Yeah. Now this is fascinating. Just that lovely journey that started when you know when you were a young boy and talking about the safe space, and then nurturing yourself essentially through that process with the aids of 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 the 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 platform that you had, which was at the school, etc and extending that into where you are today. It's a very, very, very wonderful um, story and also the power and of, of the change making that you've made um, over a period of time, which I think is uh, enlightening. In, and so at what point did you come to, as you said, 47, the, the, the People and Culture Studios? What was the spark? What was the... the uh, the momentum that you got in order to do that? Um, it was similar to the inspiration. So I was, you know, essentially a, a for lack of a better phrase, a, a documentary filmmaker trying to harness yeah. the power of that media form. And um, back in 05, 06, um, I had a lot of amazing, talented, diverse friends who were actors, writers, directors, producers. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a specific moment, um, and not to bore you with details, but there was a specific moment where I realized that 
fundamental change has to come from the top down. It can't come from the bottom up because you can have 10,000 change makers, but if the folks that are making the decisions or writing the checks aren't educated or enlightened or have a background to ultimately not look at life through a lens of fear and scarcity, but look at life through a lens of abundance, mm -hmm. that if it, and, and, you know, whatever constructs have been designed through his, history, um, it's not about blaming anybody. It's just about understanding, you know, where we've come and, and, and what we found ourselves in the construct of our, of our current situation. And so it dawned on me that we needed to have people like me, hopefully in positions of power, writing checks or making the decisions. And, and when I looked around in Hollywood at the time, I didn't see anybody like me in positions of power. And so ultimately I just asked myself, why not me? And that was the catalyst for me moving to LA in 07. Luckily I had the, the support and allyship of some significant people in the world of finance from Boston and New York and amazing mentors. Um, and a similar moment happened you know, in the, and as I was at Wayfair Studios and, and, and realizing the uphill battle and looking around the industry and as much as people wanted to do good for whatever reason, the intentionality that I saw from my own lens um, ended up becoming more lip service than actual service. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, when my time at Wayfair you know, came to an end and I knew it was time to continue my journey because uh, prior to Wayfair, I'd always wanted to build my own infrastructure and my own mm -hmm. situation. And Wayfair was an amazing opportunity to, to show off my skills to the industry and um, super grateful for the, uh, the ability and the responsibility to build and run that company mm -hmm. and lead it to where it is today and give it the foundation. Um, and it dawned on me that I wanted to go back to my own roots and, and build something that that really was the reason I moved to LA in, in 07. And, and so after uh, my little over 20 month stint at Wayfair, um, you know, I had a moment of reflection to really understand what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, talking to a few of my previous allies and co-conspirators, um, I wanted to lean in and I wanted to tackle it head on. And so even the name People of Culture Studios it is who I am, a people, a person of culture, and and actually, what I learned at Brandeis with my Jewish brethren and sisters is culture is above all, right? We shouldn't judge people; it we should try to embrace people, right? And and that notion of culture, I really learned about at Brandeis um, from the Jewish community, and and so I just leaned into what culture is and, and, and understanding your history and and being educated and, and using that to inform your future. And again, it's it's people of culture, right? And not to delineate and to divide, but to wrap our arms around and love and hug. Uh, and then also, you know, let's put it out there to be tongue in cheek. People are gonna hopefully just use POC studios and the natural inclination is say, oh, people of color studios. And that allows me to say, no, it's not a color thing. It's a have and have not thing. It's a, it's a dynamic that's bigger than color. Yes, color is a part of it. And we can't negate the color part of the conversation, but ultimately it's a have and have not thing. If you really study history, mm -hmm. it's a power greed thing where those that have power have tried to use poverty, division, lawlessness um, to divide and conquer, right? And so if we truly understand history, then we, we know it's not a color thing, but it has become a color thing. So let's rise above the color thing and realize it's a what it is and, and tackle it from that perspective down. So again, I think, you know, People of Culture Studios um, does all those things for us uh, and allows us to go head on at that narrative and then lean back in to the purpose and the mission, the mantra of using the transformative power of storytelling, injecting it with love and dignity and truth and fun. And, uh, you know, telling stories of people of culture uh, for the world and hopefully in some small way, being able to heal the trauma and the pain that so many people of culture face and, and just unite through the power, the transformative power of, of storytelling that, as we know, has existed since the dawn of time. Absolutely. It was through that verbal, that, that, that verbal narrative, that storytelling, that culture persists today because we, before we even started writing. Um, but this, this, this drive, the, the, what you've been talking about, 
there is a catalyst, there's a sort of bit of a catalyst in terms of how you represented yourself um, um, in terms of your all your views. And it's all encapsulated in one of the films that I think you did was Raisins, Not Virgins, which is a story. <laughs> about, it's a short film that you did. Um, very interesting in terms of um, Abdul, you know, immigrant coming to America. I think of a hot, a hot dog seller. Yep. Um, deals with the challenge as an immigrant you know, for his family and his relationships with the people around him and how the there's this misinterpretation of of really all religious text which i think you can you can uh, highlight a bit in terms of human interpretations as misunderstandings so i i give us a little flavor of that film Absolutely. So that um, that started off as a successful off-Broadway play in New York written by uh, a Miss Shorbury Ahmed. And uh, uh, Shorbury is also Bangladeshi and her sister and my mom are very good friends. And so Shorbury and I even grew up together. She's a few years older than me. And uh, when uh, I first made the transition of, of, of going from documentary tools or documentary media tools to more entertaining content, um, Shorbury and I began to work together. And one of the first things we wanted to do was adapt her amazing play into a feature film. And this was, you know, back in 04. Um, and I knew the uphill battle that we were going to face. So we decided to uh, make a series of three short films as, you know, our proof of concept and to show what the film was all about. Um, and we were very lucky we were able to make these uh, three-parter and then the one on on imdb is specifically about uh this moment at a hot dog sort of we took a few scenes from the feature uh and so that abdul is about that and and uh the leads sort of this interaction where even a minority a diverse individual who's running the hot dog stand and then two uh, bangladeshis who were ordering hot dog there was this tense moment of where the hot dog vendor uh said you people which is a triggering phrase to a lot of folks, right? And yeah. it, it just led to this super tense moment where the you know the characters had to really find a way to resolve that tension and sort of get out of the scene. But ultimately, it was really about the phrase "you people," right, which is used with a lot of folks. But at a higher level, uh, "Raisins Not Virgins" is, is a play on the words "hur" and "huri" and dealing with translation of. Let's 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 call a spade a spade of mainly men uh, translating from various languages, and we all know we live in a semi or mainly chauvinistic society. And uh, you know, even in Islam, you know, my dad and I talk about the fact that there are words where that say that men and women and animals walk equally. However, there's a major subsect of Muslims, specifically men who say men walk in front of women and animals, right? But the translation is men, women, and animals walk side by side as equals, right? So in a yeah. similar vein, this notion of hur and huri, one word means grapes and one word means, you know, translated virgins. Mm -hmm. And so back at the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, um, grapes were a thing of prized possession. And so it was absolutely reasonable and believable to think that, you know, to be a martyr, um, and to be promised, uh, you know, a heaven full of grapes made sense and promised a heaven full of virgins actually did not make sense because ultimately Islam isn't a chauvinistic religion and it's not about, you know, drawing a line because humans are equal. Animals, create God's creation are all equal. So um, that was a play on that translation where, again, somebody along the way and, and it's been professed or continued that, you know, this notion of promising being promised virgins over over grapes raisins um and so it was a cute way to address that head on in a you know hopefully an entertaining piece of content or a film uh, unfortunately i think we were a little bit too early uh with that concept and that topic and in the world on the heels of 9 11 and and ultimately that film uh was never financed or made um uh, but maybe one day we'll go back and revisit it i think it should be that that story needs to be told continuously and you know, in the different formats that you tell the story makes it educational, palatable for a multicultural audience. I think it's really important for something like that to keep going and to yeah. keep um, developing. And in terms of the platforms, I mean, obviously we are, we, you mentioned 
COVID or the pandemic was a bit of a game changer in terms of content production um, in say the film, film and media industries, where of course we needed to reach an audience and people couldn't move around. So that you know, Netflix had a massive spike in their, in their revenues. Um, and there's lots of new platforms like Web3, um, et cetera. So in terms of your um, people and culture um, uh, business, how are you embracing or, 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 or in, no, okay, in, embracing all these new opportunities? Well, we, we, we want to embrace all of it. Um, I, we take a lot of pride in using every tool, whether it's a technological tool or it's a human innovation operational tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the, you know, there's this notion of, uh, again, from the banks and the crash of 08, the, the notion of too big to fail, right? And yeah. you, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, when you get to a certain size, it's harder to become lean and mean and instill operational efficiencies and put tools to work that allow for scalability, growth, and even what they call the make by arbitrage from a financial term, right? Yeah. Um, capturing economics and, 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 and hopefully having that trickle down to folks that may not be getting it at the moment, but who might be more than deserved of it, right? Um, and so to your question, it's let's scour the world for every innovation, every tool, every advancement and employ them and, and be smart and calculated and, mm -hmm. and be mindful step by step and you know build case studies and, and try out models and, and test it before you fully implement it. But don't be afraid to try what may be out there and don't mm -hmm. be afraid to look and don't be afraid to challenge and push, right? Um, and so to that point, you know, we are using AI machine learning tools currently for some efforts. And we are also thinking about other ways to use AI machine learning tools um, on the team we have, uh, and this speaks to sort of an operational efficiency on the team, we have executives who both on one side can write and direct and can edit film or television, but they've also spent time, for example, in Silicon Valley one gentleman in particular, the last startup he uh, was a part of and exited was with one of the co-founders of Pixar, right? And this gentleman also spent time with the government um, perfecting streaming before people even knew what streaming was, mm -hmm. right? So I've been very lucky and fortunate to be surrounded over the course of my 23 years professionally to have met people who are in their own right change makers and challenging the paradigm. And, and so people of culture actually... I've been intentionally attracting or finding, or they've been sort of showing up on our doorstep, sort of knocking on the door and saying, Labid, what are you doing? And as I like to say, every individual who's at POC at the moment, they can wear three, maybe four hats really well. And, and that's a part of an operational efficiency. And then we as a team in a round table uh, mentality, I, I, which I learned at Exeter, it's sort of this Harkness round table philosophy. We, we challenge each other, we push each other, and we realize let's be solutions oriented. And I've been lucky to, from the inside, since I moved to LA in 07, I've been able to see a lot of the legacy issues that are still around and some of the hurdles from a, from a legal perspective, from an operational perspective, from a technology perspective. And so, you know, we're challenging ourselves to not only lean in, but to come up with solutions that maybe people aren't, or maybe people are in, in, in a certain way, but not expanding their thoughts. So we are absolutely trying to take advantage of every tool and understand the tool first and understand the beauty and the value. And then, and ultimately using these tools to, as we like to say, and Andrew Cosby, who's our chief creative officer, taught me early on in our friendship that our ultimate boss is not investors or shareholders. It's the consumer. It's the community that is watching our content that's consuming and paying for it. And so with blockchain and um, Web3 and Metaverse and all these tools, um, and even you know taking and stealing from what Kickstarter is in terms of engaging the community, we're able to 
create one-to-one -one relationships with the community um, and bring them what they want. And hopefully by bringing them what they want, they then reward us by showing up and, and paying for the content or mm -hmm. can drive them to whatever platform we want to go to. And, you know, there's companies, models that, you know, we love and hopefully we'll be working with them in a meaningful fashion very soon that uh, hopefully in some an announcements soon, but, you know, even, even a simple newsletter, right? I love newsletters, right? Of being able to have that captive audience and with the click of a button, get a newsletter out there. And if that newsletter is impactful, A24 does this really well. And now they have a coffee table book, but this notion of a, of a newsletter that very simply can connect with your audience and giving them content and then creating that push pull harmonious relationship between your audience and your community and, and the creators and, and hopefully even inspiring your community and audience to maybe have a sense of ownership or even align and come to this side on the creator side, because we have that ability to communicate mm -hmm. and transcend these walls, these ivory towers that have existed um, and create that direct relationship. So, so you mentioned something about community, which I think at the end of the day is your ultimate consumer and also your, your um, uh, challenger, because they would, you know, challenge you to come up, continue coming up with, with, with content, which is entertaining. Um, your use of social media in terms of the, the, the typical platforms from Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, etc. cetera. Um, have you built into your, 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 your um, business model and an, an amplification of, of what you want to say through those channels? 100%, it's a, it's a part of the roadmap. Um, we did it at Wayfair Studios, right? Yeah. I had a, um, by the time, uh, you know, by the time I left, we had close to 30 employees. We had six different departments and one of those departments was a, a marketing department. And in fact, mm. we, you know, we, in the deal with Disney, um, the way we structured it, we, you know, we were right there. Part of our deal was that we were right there with the marketing department, helping to shape the marketing strategy with them. And again, there was no additional economic benefit because it was a sale to Disney, a, a, you know, a long-term uh, licensing deal with Disney. Um, so there was no other economic benefit we would gain. We simply wanted to make sure uh, because Justin made an amazing film that really needed to be seen because of the, the impact we knew it would have on the community, similar to what his feet, his film Five Feet Apart had with the community. And I, I saw that firsthand, by the way, people would, would write letters and emails to us about the impact of that film. So mm -hmm. we just wanted to make sure as many people as possible would see clouds. And so we worked with Disney's marketing team very closely. And we even developed our own TikTok challenges and, uh, and that worked. And um, so we, we were very much involved and then when we released uh, Justin's book with Simon and Schuster, we were right there with the marketing team with Simon mm -hmm. and Schuster, and we had incredible results with our our little team. In addition to Simon and Schuster, so much so that uh, it inspired long term conversations with these major entities. Right, so um, we did it effectively um, at Wayfair, and absolutely, uh, we're going to do it at POC. And I just wanted to make sure that the foundation was built to the last year uh, to steal from Elon Musk's sort of playbook. The last year was battle testing the team, right? Um, using somebody else's car, right? Sort of yeah. the, <laughs> the Lotus car and testing out the engine and the team to make sure that we're ready to come out in our car, right? Um, and so the last year has really been making sure the foundation for the house was set and strong to support the four walls and, and the roof. Mm -hmm. And, and what we've been able to do, and I've been very uh, obviously thrilled and proud and, and of our accomplishments, we, we fully and truly battle tested the team. So now our, our content backbone is set and now we can sort of enter phase two, which is now extending and, and beginning to put the content out there mm -hmm. and then you know adding the other departments or arms to what we do. But you have to control all aspects. I mean, this is no different than the major studios, right? Uh, except, and this has always been a part of my, my thought or my thesis, right? Why can't we replicate the best of the major studios? We're not trying to reinvent anything. Let's refine, right? Let's take the best of what's mm -hmm. existed, refine it, and use these tools and, and an outlook with 
efficiency at its core and, and create a future. But we, we shouldn't, we're not reinventing anything. We're just re refining and taking advantage of tools that are now at our disposal and challenging ourselves to come up with new constructs that are yeah. just adding layers. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example and um, without giving away my, my full business plan, but you know, there's a beautiful way to use metaverse red carpet premieres and in real life red carpet premieres and create this amazing symbiotic relationship where they can happen at the same time, but they might get completely different experiences, right? And, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, uh, which is why we are focused on being a distributor, a theatrical distributor and mm -hmm. going back to Windows and going back to Windows because that is what allows us to build a tale and what they call library value in in films and in content and and not you know leaning into the the cost plus model which everybody is speaking to at the moment right going back to the the reason why so many of us are are in entertainment because we know there's tremendous opportunity for upside and back end and long term value um, yeah. right by by the success of content t t TV and film. And so part of that is going back to windows and licensing and controlling your IP. And before you start knowing that you have the ability to have a 20 year IP strategy, if you look at the full 360, right? From video games to even board games to now metaverse and AR, VR activations. And, um, you know, uh, Andy Cosby, I consider him to be an amazing world builder. I mean, he is a cornucopia of ideas and he's just a, a, a brilliant, brilliant mind in terms of storytelling and, and world building. And, um, and, and his proof is in his, in his own track record and what he's doing and who he's doing it for and the, and the brands and the companies like Activision Blizzard and big gaming properties that he's helping to adapt from game to screen. And, mm -hmm. um, so he has that corner from a creative side, right? And so he's our creative backstop and I'm challenging us on the business side. And so together, you know, two sides of the same coin, you know, we want to just push the envelope and, and ultimately use these tools to speak directly and love and embrace our community. And ultimately, as I like to say, my, my job is simple. I'm about, I'm a preservationist of capital and talent, right? So by using these tools, we then protect our partners, our finance partners, and we protect uh, our talent. And I've always, again, going back to spaces, if you create a safe space and somebody feels safe in that space, they will become the best version of themselves. And when they become, become the best version of themselves, incredible magical things happen. And that's what we want to do. Make magic, right? Create magic and give people that space to be the best version of themselves. Well, that's beautiful. But at the end of the day, the technology is there to help you. The technology is there to maintain that 20 year tail in terms of ownership, copyright, protecting the content, and also protecting the, in a way, protecting the user of the content because they feel that they're on a truth and trusted space so that the content that they are consuming comes from an honest and credible space as well. So they're not absorbing content that's been um, created in for nefarious reasons. Correct. And and look, here, the, the, the truth is the creator of the IP, the creator of the story, the creator of the world should 100% be involved in the lifeline, the life cycle, the full life cycle of what happens to that IP because it's their mind's eye that created that world and created the characters. And so mm -hmm. they know it better than anybody. So we should have them front and center at the table with a chair with their name on it, helping to make decisions as we are developing that strategy. And to your point, let's take advantage of every tool so we can protect that part, part of it, right? Um, and again, Andy has built a reputation of doing just that. You know, he was a creative co-founder of Boom Studios, which at the time before he left was, you know, number five or six graphic novel publishing company in the world, right? And he he made his, he built his reputation on protecting comic book writers and creators. And, you know, Two Guns, for example, was one of his babies. And 
uh, he, he he found the artist and the the creator of that story and helped to become a comic book and then shepherded it into a very successful movie, right? And so he's built his reputation on protecting creators and, and from, from that side. And hopefully I've done that from the business finance side and the technical side. And so, you know, Andy and I, you know, we talk about what are the innovations we can use to take full advantage of what he's done historically well and, and what I've done from the business side and, and apply those ideations and attach the tools and create new models that again, aren't reinventing the wheel that are just refining it and creating a new way in. And the thing is the business models around that at the end of the day, in the way that people consume um, the, the, the content and you're creating your audience um, requires a continuous supply of capital to produce the content, but also a, 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 a revenue model that matches what your the investors, whether it's big direct investors or some form of crowdfunding. So in terms of the growth of your business and the matching of the capital raising and then the revenue models to match that. So how are you building the POC business on that, on that basis? So for us, that's one strategy. Obviously, the traditional, um, you know, I've been very blessed to work with very large institutional financiers and private equity, private equity funds and, you know, high net worth investors through my journey. So that traditional route should still stay and, again, offer value that folks like that have not seen in the past. So we want to create strategies that um address their bottom line and protect them in ways that haven't happened. So there's innovation in that. And, and ultimately it's not that innovative. We're, we're just being transparent and, and, and being honest and, and showing what the deal looks like and, and teaching or educating and, and, and making sure that we are capturing economics from the top down and, and not parsing out any portion of the waterfall, as they say, but in terms of, of technology, um, blockchain, crypto, crowdfunding. Um, I think, as we've seen, and obviously there's there's different conversations at the moment with with you know things in terms of the crash, and people are are saying a bunch of things, but ultimately there's that direct connection, right? I think blockchain, crypto, and even the the dirty word NFT right now, right? Because um, some people don't don't look at it fondly, but. It allows us, I think it's just an extension of, of Kickstarter and, and the crowdfunding that, that happened mm. with that model, right? And allowing us to engage uh, and then be fully transparent in how capital is used and, and with the smart chain uh, contracts and whatnot. And so being being okay with being transparent because sure. it's good to be transparent. Let us be transparent and let us talk to the, to the truth of the business and say, here are the pain points and here's how we're going to address them. And here's our, our model from development to monetization, right, and distribution. So get out ahead of all of that and and put it out there, and so that what we say day one is what we say and do day two hundred and one, right, or two thousand and one, right. So um, I, I embrace that transparency that we're mm-hmm. getting from blockchain and smart contracts, and you know to lean in on that that crowdfunding notion. If you find your audience and you give them what they want and you create a sense of ownership in what we're doing, amazing things can happen. And we're seeing that. And, yeah. and um, we're coming from the top down of like, okay, if we're going to use a NFT strategy, let's already have the content strategy mapped out so that the, the thing that we're putting out into the world, whatever it is through the blockchain is something that we know the audience wants. And Again, you know, I, I look at it. I, I like to be a simple person and look at things in a simple way. So, it's a digital baseball card collectible, and it's a membership card that unlocks value and worlds. And so, if you look at it in that way, how are we giving value as a collectible, digital collectible, and then what worlds and doors and opportunities are we opening and unlocking with the key, right? And and mm-hmm. but ultimately with the story and these worlds and these. TV shows, film, pieces of content, games that are exciting and that the audience wants to be a part of. So starting with that first and foremost, and then reverse engineering the right strategy Mm -hmm. to then present to the community and say, hey, this is not us just putting something up to see what happens. This is us putting something up because we've already mapped out exactly where we're going to land. You know, again, we know we're going to build a colony on the moon 
and we're going to start here, but we're going to show you the pathway of how we're building a colony on the moon. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, using the technology is the, it should be a seamless, quiet way to deliver honest, truthful, and transparent content to the consumer. You can call it NFT, you can call it, call it blockchain, you can call it anything like that, but who cares? It just does what it says on the tin. Yes, exactly. Entertaining, it's truthful, it's trusted, and I'm happy to pay for it because it gives me an insight into the world. 100%. And lean in to truth. You know, one of the things that we like to say is we want to shine uh, the spotlight of truth around the world and even put mirrors around it and, and reveal what the world is because only after we see the truth can we tackle some of the issues and hurdles that we've you know, encountered or we still encounter. And so with that truth and transparency and the direct spotlight, uh, mm -hmm. we, can, we can tackle it and not be afraid of it. Yeah. So, so, so POC, if, 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 do, you, do you consider yourself a platform for creating that level of what I call transparent, diverse content? Or is it just a company that produces the content? It's both. Um, it's uh, the easiest way to frame this narrative for the question you just asked is, I think of ourselves like a next generation Disney. Yes. Right? Where it's the, the top-down approach where we're going to have our Marvel, our Pixar, our Lucas, our Hulu, and Innovation Labs, and ultimately from a top-down approach, we're making sure that we have and map out the strategy for whatever business unit underneath the umbrella. And whether it's traditional theme parks or AR, VR, metaverse theme parks or video games or graphic novels or animation or you know, making a, a backdoor pilot film, making a film that we know we're designing as a backdoor pilot for a TV series, right? It's making sure that that strategy is in place from the top down and everything is there for success. And then we make sure all the business units and all the producers and companies and talent that we support, um, again, the independent space has historically worked from the bottom up in a linear fashion of like, let's, let's, let's try to figure out how we can take an idea and then finance it into a script and then figure out how we can raise money and do this and do this and do this and rely on a, a plethora of folks who might not always care about the content or care about the capital. They might just care about the fees they're collecting along the way, right? And so the, the independent space uh, in Hollywood has been designed like that where everybody is just sort of building brick by brick from the bottom up because for whatever reason, um, they're not able to build and design from the top down and then build from the bottom up. Sort of, you know, I, I like to say we let's go 30,000 feet, know the strategy, come back on the ground, build up, go back, go down and, and sort of have that reverse engineering to make sure that everything we do is, is, is mapped out intentionally, methodically. So we do achieve the goals and the results we want to achieve. Um, so that's, again, the easiest way to describe it is you know, we want to sort of be a, a united artist from yesterday, uh, built by and for the artist community that we're protecting them with the 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 strategy and the discipline and the, and the foresight of a of a Disney and 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 building this ecosystem where we protect all the creators and talent in our ecosystem uh, with the ability to really harness technology and business acumen and the relationships to design everything we do for success and not jump into it until we know we've got all the pieces in play for that roadmap. Mm -hmm. You must have a long queue outside your office of people wanting to work for you. Um, well, we're, uh, we have folks that, uh, that, are, that are there and we have a great sort of nucleus right now, uh, a little shy of 12 feet people. And then we have what I call the extended family of folks that sort of come, come, come and go. And, you know, my goal, hopefully in the next year is to be able to bring all that, the greater family, you know, inside the house uh, permanently. Um, but we're also, at the end of the day, it's people, right? Um, 
Hilton, as you probably know more than others, right? If George Dorio, the, the one of the founders of venture capitalism said, you know, I'd rather, I would only invest in a grade A person who might have a grade B idea than invest with the grade B person who has a grade A idea, right? And the simple notion behind that, it's, it's people, people, people. So uh, I like to invest in amazing people and, and, mm-hmm. and, and invest, really invest. We don't hire people, we invest in people. And, and we invest in people that um, are good, who have a great heart and we know have the right intention. And, and by investing in them, they will then invest back with us. And that, that sort of ecosystem is really what's gonna allow us, God willing, to be successful. Um, uh, but so we're, 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 we're picky, um, but we are, we're open, right? We wanna, we wanna scour the earth for the amazing humans who wanna do great work and then create, build that infrastructure and that safe space around them through the platform that we have. Uh, but also we're content creators, right? But we also wanna find, you know, Andy's been in the business a long time, right? Um, and so he wants to find the next person who looks like him or doesn't look like him and help give them the opportunity that they might not think they have, but they have the talent and the desire and the hunger. So. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it did beautifully. I mean, this is, you know, I could go on for hours talking to you, Libid. This is such a fascinating story um, that you're telling and a vision and a mission. And one of your quotes is, we endeavor to maximize the full 360 degrees of the content landscape for graphic novels, to podcasts, to board games, video games, to feature films, TV series, to live action, to animation, to metaverse actions, obviously in the AR and the VR. Um, um, space and beyond the unknown. <laughs> yes. Challenging yourself. <laughs> hey, uh, like I said earlier, uh, why not me? Right? I, yeah. I might as well try. And uh, you know, I, without getting too spiritual, philosophical, it's like I think, you know, we're we're all put on this earth for a, a, a reason, and and hopefully before we die, we we understand what that reason is, right? And I feel lucky. Um, I almost died when I was 19, uh, between the summer of my freshman and sophomore year. And I think that changed everything for me, which allowed me to not live trying to plan for the future, just living for the moment and trying to, you know, as they say, feed my soul. Uh, and I think that was a transformative, not to say that everyone should almost die in their, <laughs> in their life. But I think that for me was a, was a big moment that allowed me to stop living with fear and stop living for tomorrow and just living for today. And so with that sort of foundation early in my life, I, I, I've been blessed to challenge myself, right? Why not? Well, what do I have to lose? I have nothing to lose. Um, and luckily I have an amazing wife uh, and amazing parents and now an amazing almost six-year-old daughter who, you know, put up with, uh, put up with me and, and, and love me for me. And, you know, I try to balance, juggle the time between family and, and my work, but ultimately work is play. And, uh, and so I am just blessed. I feel very lucky. Brilliant. Thank you. And if anybody wants to speak to you and contact you, can you just please for um, provide them with the best way to get a hold of you through your company and the social media channels? Absolutely. So uh, I'm on most of the socials. Uh, my tag, uh, I guess my handle is at Haji Love, H-A-D-J-I-L-O-V-E. Um, tongue in cheek, that harkens back to my my hip hop days and my love for Johnny Quest and, and Haji. So um, so yeah, I'm on all socials and I, I read my Instagram messages. I respond and, uh, you know, it's the, the door is open. Thank you very much indeed for that. This has been an inspirational hour I've spent with you, Labid. I thank you very much indeed for your time. And I will be watching the development of um, the People and Culture Studios very carefully. And I ask the audience to please follow um, Labid and his team on social media. And we will be publishing all the social media um, handles at the bottom of this podcast as well as how you can get hold of and follow people and culture studios in LA and all their achievements. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. This is Hilton Supra from openbusinesscouncil.org, citiesabc.com and fashionabc.org, 
which are the channels which are using fourth industrial revolution technologies and the channels in which we will be amplifying the wonderful message that we got from Labid Aziz today. Thank you very much indeed. And, and Hilton, um, you were a, a joy to talk to and speak to and have this amazing, wonderful conversation. And it really speaks to who you are. And thank you for creating the space for this amazing conversation. And, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to um, be able to connect with your audience, your amazing audience that you guys have cultivated. And so uh, just thank you for this time. I really appreciate it. And I really look forward to a continued engagement with you because there's a lot of things you're doing that are very aspirational and very important to our community as well. So thank you very much indeed for your time, Libid. Okay, I look forward to it.